Hello, guys. Uh, a warm welcome to everyone gathered here to this webinar, Dev Voyage, Navigating Game Development. Devs REC is excited to partner with Angel Hack for this webinar on game development. We are thrilled to have each one of you here ready to engage and participate in an enriching learning experience. We'll be looking about trends and technologies, tools and systems in game development. Throughout this session, we encourage active involvement, ask questions, share your thoughts, and make the most out of this opportunity. Devs REC is a technical club in Rajalakshmi Engineering College that emerged after a year of hard work and challenges. The club focuses on various domains, including web, application, game, and blockchain development, augmented reality, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, machine learning, Internet of Things, and UI works. They have been actively conducting many workshops, symposium, technical events, and even more. So, Hello everyone. So I am Raga Kitana. I am the I am delighted to be here with you today as community builder at Angel Hack. And yes, so Angel Hack is a global hub for hackathons, fostering in innovation and collaboration among developers, designers, and tech enthusiasts worldwide. Our core values: inventive, inquisitive, unconventional, tenacious, and adventurous drive us to push boundaries and create transformative solutions. Join us in shaping the future of technology. Thank you. Uh, let me tell you something about our guest of honor today. Meet Justin Scott Beshar, man of today's event, a dedicated game developer born on May 6, 1996. Currently part of the Paladin, where he is involved in the Cutthroat franchise, Justin has contributed to the development of published games such as Game Point, Battle Solitaire, Heart Hunt, Clever Jason, Word Tornado, card party, and more, spanning across Android, iOS, and various platforms. Driven by a passion for programming that ignited during hospital stay in 2011, Justin's journey began with exploring the source code of Run Escape after a gymnastics accident. Beyond his professional role, he invests his spare time in side projects, documenting them on his blog and Instagram. It's time for our guest, Mr. Justin, to share his knowledge. Please, sir. So hello, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me and see my screen. And if I yes. don't hear anything, I think it's all right. All right. So well, uh, thanks, first of all, for the introduction. Uh, this talk will indeed be about navigating you through game development. And I will do so by sharing my experience, my uh, path, my journey. Uh, but also sharing you some of the insights of what we use, what tools, etc., for the game. Uh, yeah, for for starting your career making video games. Um, you might know me also from social media. Um, I have a big presence on Instagram uh, with uh, almost one hundred twenty thousand followers, and also on TikTok with almost twenty five, and uh, just shy two and a half thousand on YouTube. Uh, where I try to make more educational content, share insights, tips and tricks, and also make some uh, share some fun insights about uh, the games industry as well. Um, well, it all started for me uh, when I accidentally got in, injured and got hospital hospitalized. I had uh, I broke my knee by accident, uh, and actually it was in the hospital that I started to get my hands on a laptop for the first time. Uh, I come from. Well, a, a very normal family where we didn't really have uh, yeah, that much technology. We only had one shared computer. So I didn't really have that much time as we have nowadays uh, around technology to really um, yeah, explore and see how we can create games. Uh, so when I was in hospital, I got bored after well being there one day. I have to be there for three days uh, due, to my host uh, due, due to my injury. And within those days, I figured out how... Uh, RuneScape was made. Um, I managed my ways to get into a um, private server. I played around with some of the codes. I also had no idea what coding was back in the day. I was just changing some colors, changing some um, positions of some objects, and really making it a bit more fun of what I would like to see. And also, it felt a bit magical that you can see stuff changing in a game you really liked. Um, well, and this all eventually ended up to my career I am currently following. 
so it started in two, 2011 where I started programming in the hospital, uh, creating a RuneScape private server. Uh, then I think it was around 2012 uh, when my brother actually told me like, hey, uh, there is this uh, educational program on a college, which is called uh, yeah, a game development um, uh, a game development degree, um, which I found pretty interesting because, well, it was looking very similar to what I was doing all the time with my um, yeah, with my private server. And then I realized, hey, there is uh, actually a career in this path. So I went to that. Well, first I went to an, uh, a trial of that college and I in instantly fell in love. So I pursued doing that, uh, uh, yeah, getting that degree uh, where I eventually also had in 2016 and 17 uh, two internship, which of the first was at GamePoint. And GamePoint is a, a social casino, a social multiplayer, making a lot of card games. Uh, their biggest game is a bingo game. Um, and that's where I first started um, yeah, making some prototypes for. And in my second half I of my, in, of my um, internships, I went to the Dutch Aerospace Center where I worked a lot on the um, AR development, uh, which we now have with the upcoming, uh, uh, yeah, like like the Meta Quest 3 and the upcoming uh, Apple um, AR devices. It's becoming more booming now, but uh, I already started on it in around 2017 with the HoloLens, uh, the first edition of it, uh, creating some uh, yeah, gamified applications for um, aerospace students to learn more about uh, yeah, aircraft. Uh, later in 2017, after I got uh, my education, I started working at GamePoint as a full-time game programmer. I worked there on 11 releases, uh, which of the biggest releases was uh, Card Party, uh, Battle Solitaire, and uh, the Casino Game. I learned there a lot, uh, but eventually I also wanted to be more into uh, yeah some gamified games, some more entertaining games, I mean. Uh, and that's when I started to join Paladin Studios, also here uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, where I have been mainly working on the Cut Rope franchise, uh, especially on Cut Rope Remastered on Apple Arcade. Uh, but I've also been working on uh, some yeah, more global stuff for the entire company, where I also have uh, had my hands on the My Tomagotchi Forever mobile application, both for Android and iOS, uh, which is a great hit. And if you haven't played it, I can really recommend you to play it. We uh, just updated it to be more applicable for the latest devices as well. So what is it, what I do exactly? Well, I am a game programmer and as a game programmer, I write and design code uh, that brings a video game to life, implementing game mechanics, uh, graphics, audio, and much more. But thereby I also have a specialization, which is in software architecture, uh, meaning that I focus a lot on the structure of the code base to keep everything in line for well, the entire company and that we can reuse stuff for future games or uh, you use our learnings to make everything better and better performant as well for the company as a whole. But in games, you also have other uh, job titles and disciplines. So I made it just a simple overview here of what kind of uh, overviews there are. Uh, well, in the programming, you have a generalist, which is basically um, if you have, if you don't really have a specialization, if you think everything is kind of nice or you know a little bit of everything or you, yeah, like I said, you don't really want to specialize in anything. You can be a generalist, which is basically doing everything um, or also mostly solo developers are also a generalist. Uh, but you can also focus more on gameplay, uh, tools and systems, architecture, graphics, uh, server programming, backend programming, or more. Um, for art and design, you also have a lot of disciplines where you have 2D artists, uh, 3D artists, uh, environment artist, level artist, uh, game design, uh, economy design, and also much more in that uh, discipline. For production, you also have some non-technical uh, um, jobs, uh, job titles, where you can be a producer, you can be a game director, you can be a scrum master, you can be a live operator, which is really uh, yeah, making sure that the creative side of programming and art and design uh, are all uh, tied together and yeah, can can do their work without a lot of uh, distractions from yeah the whole company or like the whole uh, corporate structures. Uh, then you also have QA, uh, not QNA, but QA, which stands for quality insurance, which are often uh, testers or making test autom automations, so we can make sure that the games are always working and that there are uh, yeah as less as bugs as possible for the consumers. And then you also have a marketing side where you have the marketeer, you have business intelligence, and you have analysts who really analyze the 
the game and market uh, yeah market on upon that. Uh, are there any questions? By the way, I don't know if I can see the chat, but if there are any questions, just feel free to interrupt me. Um, I also noticed that I skipped over the other part to ask questions, so please let me know if uh, or interrupt me if you have any or put up on your hands. So I also want to focus a bit more on the programming and art and design part. Uh, that I basically want to go over with you about the uh, tools we use. But then in specifically, uh, first, what will the operator system we use? And then you have the good old uh, yeah, discussion of Mac versus Windows, or Windows versus Mac. Um, and basically, the answer is that both devices are great for making video games. Oh, yeah. I see a question about the average pay. So I will go back quickly for to this page. The average pay for a game tester, um, it really depends, of course, also per um, in which country you're in. Uh, but often they are basically in the first tier. Often you have a, or skill, you have uh, uh, some skills, and basically you are often in the first skill of um, of salaries um, as a programmer or art. It quite depends on um, how you said, how experienced you are, on what level you are. You will also start as a first year as a uh, junior, uh, but you can scale up um, once you get into a meteor, uh, senior or principal level, and then also within the disciplines as a uh, architecture for often uh, get paid more as gameplay. But then there are also some differentiation between what kind of gameplay you will work on. Um, so it's kind of hard to say. Uh, I cannot really say an average pay, but I think you should just see it as like a normal, uh, a normal payment for, uh, with within the uh, industry. Uh, also, I would like to say, uh, or to like to mention that all these disciplines, um, it also really depends on the size of a company. If you work in a big company. Uh, you really have more narrow specializations of what to do. Uh, if you work on like a big combat game, you will also have uh, programmers that work solely on a combat system. But if you work on an indie studio, which you have just like three or four uh, game developers or game programmers, then often everyone is a generalist, knowing every uh, knowing about everything, and sometimes just one guy that does all the backend stuff. Uh, or even if you are a solo developer, you need to know them all to, yeah, kind of get your way through. Uh, that's also one thing I want to have noticed, uh, want to have said about it. So I will get back to the operation systems. Um, like I said, it doesn't really matter which operating system you use. Uh, I am personally always using uh, Windows, but I also work on Mac because we make uh, iOS games as well. Um, but also within companies, often we have some automation for that. So I don't really need a Mac uh, all the way, all, all the time to make uh, iOS games. But if you want to use it for study and you want to make iOS games, I would recommend uh, creating or, or using a Mac. And otherwise, I would just choose to whatever you're most comfortable with. If you always have been using a Windows or if you've always have been using a Mac, just choose any of those. Uh, and if you don't know what to choose, uh, Try to choose what your surrounding says. If you have people or friends or family that always use Mac, uh, try to also go to that route so you can uh, yeah, ask them if you have any problems with your operating system. Uh, but in general, it doesn't really matter for making games what kind of operation system you use. Same for Linux, by the way. But I, if you use Linux, I think you already understand that, you, that it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Then for programming and art, we have different tools we use. Um, for programming, we often use uh, Microsoft uh, Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code, uh, which are used a lot as a free option to create code or to write code in. Um, but in a professional field, uh, we often use JetBrains, uh, which is a more paid subscription version of, uh, of, of a code editor, which has a lot of extra tools to them, uh, which make it more um, yeah, enhancing their, and, and, and speeding up the efficiency of of writing codes for games. Uh, but if you want to start out, I would really recommend to just download Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code and uh, try and get your way through on how to make some or on how to write, write some code. But I will also follow up more on that later. Uh, and for art, uh, Adobe with um, 
uh, with Photoshop and uh, Illustrator are used a lot for 2D art. Uh, and then you have uh, applications such as Blender and Maya, which are used a lot to make uh, 3D sculptures or free assets, etc. So those are used a lot. And then we have also game engines, which there are two main engines mainly used in the games industry where you have Unity and Unreal. And then you also have the, the common question, what should you choose? What is the best to choose? Uh, and here is actually the same as within the uh, operation systems. It doesn't really matter what you choose or what, what there is no better or best within the engines. It just depends on what you want to create and within what you want to create, there are the um, options you can choose for. Uh, for example, if you want to make 2D mobile games, but also want to be able to create 3D mobile games, uh, Unity is a great option for that to create some more minimalistic games um, that are less well enthusiastic on uh, on saying to porting to console or whatever. Although it has the capabilities, Unreal is much better in uh, or has a much better uh, better render pipeline. So if you want to make some really high quality games for console uh, um, or for your PC, then Unreal Engine is definitely uh, a route to choose. But Unity has great in overall and uh, it's been used a lot in the industry as well. So um, yeah, it, it really depends on what your interest is in kind of games you want to make. Um, and also I want to say that uh, you can switch between learning the both. I would also really recommend to learn both. But when you start out, just pick and choose one uh, for the first, uh, for let's say the first year to really understand more about that engine uh, and then try to use that knowledge you learned from the one end, uh, from one engine, uh, transform it to the other. Are there any questions about uh, these games engines and the operation systems, by the way? Then please let me know in the chat. I see a good question about Scrum Master. Uh, Scrum Master is uh, a Scrum Master is a um, yeah it's it's for production who uh, manages the team to work in Agile Sprint. And I also see a question about Godot. I will follow up on that uh, immediately after. Uh, but Scrum Master is uh, within uh, well the tech industry. We have a agile development, which means we work with uh, with tasks and tickets, um, which needs to be uh, estimated and uh, scoped and need to be uh, um, organized. So we have scrum masters that um, basically manage everyone to make sure that the tickets are up to date, that the tickets are created, and that the tickets are assigned, and that we have a uh, yeah, as we call it, sprint, which is basically a weekly or biweekly goal uh, to achieve, and then send out to the players or make internal uh, internal uh, milestones uh, to get to a game or get the game released, etc. I hope that answers your question. Then regarding to the game engines, um, Godot, uh, first of all, yeah, Unity and Unreal are the most used at the, at the moment. Godot has been uprising due to the uh, Unity runtime fee that has been introduced. Um, but to me, that wasn't really a surprise as Unreal also has a, a sort of runtime fee uh, and Unity didn't have it yet. So it was a move they did, which not everyone still was so happy about. And Godot doesn't have a runtime fee yet. And I have here some more engines that are used in the industry. Where of is also Godot on the left, uh, on the top left. Uh, Godot is a great engine, but it's not used that, that much in the industry yet, uh, basically because it's not uh, that far development uh, developed such as uh, Unity or Unreal are. Uh, and also people are not, or the industry is not as confident with the Godot engine yet, but there is definitely an uprise in Godot. So it's definitely also together with these engines here, I showcase here as well, to get around with it, play with it, uh, and at least have a, have a short understanding of it. Uh, there are also two engines I showcase here, which are Frostbite and Cry Engine. Those are really top-notch engines used by AAA studios. Often you need to have a paid subscription for them. Um, it's not needed to know how to make them, but it's not too good to know the uh, having awareness of them. So you can have in your studies some direction of how this works and how you can uh, prepare yourself for developing to these engines. But Godot is definitely an engine used in the industry. 
uh, but not that much as Unity or Unreal yet. I hope that answers the question for the... So with that said about, uh, about the engines, I will move on to, oh, I see another engine, uh, another question. Uh, I will read it by the way. Uh, I've been using Unreal Engine for a while and I've got comfortable with using uh, its blueprint system or uh, for development on the long term. If I were taking a game, if I were taking game development as a profession, should I switch to coding in profession in programming languages? If yes, what language should I focus on other than C Sharp? Um, well, first of all, there are game developers that are making their profession with solely blueprints. That is definitely possible. If that is something you are most comfortable with, that is something I could recommend chasing. But however, I would recommend to learn programming as well. Uh, if you uh, are already a bit um, knowledge or a bit experience with C Sharp due to uh, Unity, I would also really recommend to try out and learn more about C++, basically because Unreal Engine uh, supports C++ so you can develop your own blueprints and uh, yeah, get your way or manage to um, make more advanced uh, features in the engine as well. So again, it doesn't really matter if you keep focus on blueprints, that's all fine. Uh, there are professions in there, but to also widen your field and wider uh, your possibility within the in the industry, also try to learn some C++ and create some own blueprints. Another question is about the game engines, uh, which is like user-friendly to fiddle around about game development. Uh, well, in that case, definitely uh, Unity, but also Godot and GameMaker are great for uh, for, for user-friendly and beginner-friendly to fiddle around about game development. Uh, those are yeah, having a lot of tools already created and you can really um, yeah, get around it quickly and get to understand it quickly. Um, so those are basically the, the free, so Unity, Godot, and uh, GameMaker. Uh, another question is, as we know, you are a game programmer. Uh, do you like any other uh, programming like design or production site? Um, or any other than programming like design or production site? Well, for me personally, I am not, not a big fan of doing um, design or production. Um, that's also not where my expertise really is, uh, lies. But it, also this is really dependable on what kind of uh, yeah, career path you want to chase. If you want to be a, let's say, solely, solo or indie game developer, you really need to uh, yeah, also have some understanding of production and also some understanding of design. So you might need to make, your, if, if you're a solo developer, you need to make your own art assets as well. Um, but yeah, for me personally, I am solely focusing on program on programming. Uh, that's where my uh, passion lies. Another question I see is uh, what the companies like Activision and Tencent use. Um, I don't know the question or I don't know the answer. Um, I said like I, I don't know the the real answer to it. I do know that. Um, that I think uh, Activision at least has their own game engine, uh, which could be similar to like Frostbite, Cry Engine, and Unreal Engine. Uh, but uh, I have no experience within the, their uh, the, their field, so I I have no idea what they how they actually create it. Uh, but there are also um, I said like like their child companies, like companies that are from Activision or Tencent and or or who they are uh, developing with and. They are sometimes also using uh, Unity or Unreal Engine, uh, creating games that are just um, yeah under the Activision franchise. But I think their top games uh, like uh, Call of Duty and such, those are uh, I think most likely create, developed in their own engine, which is then solely focused on making that big hit game possible. But that is on, only happening when you really have a specific niche game, uh, such as uh, racing simulators as well. I know that uh, a game like uh, Forza Horizon, uh, and then not the Horizon Zero Dawn, but the Forza Horizon, which is uh, also a, a racing simulation game, uh, will, uh, which is all developed in their own engine because it's solely focused on racing and nothing else. 
So I think that's the same for uh, the games as Activision and Tencent. I hope that answered all your questions. Then I will move on to the next slide, which are more about essential skills uh, within the game development industry. Uh, and this is also mainly focused on the, from the programming side, uh, where the essential skills are mainly laying within the physics, math, and problem solving. Um, mathematics and physics are the foundation of every game. Uh, we often just, or we often, we actually just start with a screen with pixels, which go up, left, and right. And if you want to add depth, etc you need to have some form of mathematical um, yeah, background and a physics background to understand how that works and how that uh, how it behaves. And also a lot of problem solving as well. Programming uh, is always one big puzzle where you have to so solve the problems to uh, yeah, make it all work. Uh, but I do like to say that uh, it's, it's not that you really need to be good with math, physics, or problem solving. It's just that you need to start and like it. It's it's just you need to to become comfortable with it, um, because when I was a student in high school, I really hated physics, I really hated math, uh, but that was basically all because I just hated it to see how it worked on paper. But when I started to uh, do game development and started to see how math and physics are actually applied by uh, solving complex uh, uh, complex challenges uh, and seeing how it actually looks like when it goes wrong. That really makes me uh, yeah, more interested in mathematics and physics and really understanding on why it's used. Uh, so that all uh, yeah, gets me to, it all ties together with creativity. Uh, in the end, it's just, uh, it doesn't matter if you really understand uh, or uh, you should understand, but if you really like math a lot, it's just that you need to find creative ways to face these challenges and resolve these challenges uh, and don't be yeah, uh, afraid of the mathematical or physics uh, underlaying structure underneath it. If there are any questions about um, some of these essential skills, I would like uh, to answer them as well. So feel free to, uh, to ask them. A question, uh, if every AAA company uh, have their own engine, then what is the point of learning these engines? How would these learnings uh, will help me? Uh, good question. Uh, basically, how that works is um, all these engines, uh, also Unity, Unreal, uh, and well, AAA companies' own engines are all kind of similar. They all have their similar approaches. They have similar components. They have similar uh, tools, but they're, it's more that a AAA company truly develops these tools for their specific needs, for their specific niche in their game, uh, to really realize the uh, ambition their uh, game wants to achieve. So if you want to learn how to how these tools work or want to have a understanding on how these tools work, you also need to use other game engines so you get an understanding of, um, yeah, of how to work with it. That's also a reason why I really recommend to try and work with Unity, try to work with Unreal, try to work with Godot, or try to create games without engines, because then you learn how to uh, switch between different tools as well. So if you if you manage to go, go into work for a AAA company uh, and you will switch from one to the other, you will also switch from other engines as well. So those are really, um, yeah, it's, it's really an essential skill to know how different tools work. But the basics lay all the same, and they're all, uh, well, I think AAA companies work mo mostly with C++ uh, uh, scripting. Uh, but I also know from uh, uh, AAA studios such as uh, um, Scott, uh, Ubisoft, where they have also their own visual scripting uh, uh, tools for uh, designers and stuff. But there are also programmers that are uh, supporting those systems for designers as well. So it really depends on... Um, on, on the company and they all have different structures and uh, and usages for it. So learn as much of the engines as you uh, as you can. But a uh, good question. If there are any more questions? Just uh, feel free to ask them. Um, yes, sir. We have another question in Q and oh. A session. Yeah. Can you view that? Can you see that? 
Can you please let me know which question it is? Because for me, the last question was about the AAA companies, and I don't see any other question. Okay. Oh, there it comes. Uh, as a gameplay pro uh, programmer, can I develop games with uh, only basic shapes and assets, like a 2D shooter with only squares and circles uh, my uh, for my portfolio? Or should I develop uh, complete games with neat UI and assets? Uh, well, as a gameplay programmer, uh, that's it, it. You can basically create a portfolio all with uh, with basic shapes and assets. Uh, that doesn't really really matter. The, basically, when uh, we are so hiring uh, game gameplay programmers or programming in generals, we don't really look at uh, the at, how you say it, like at the visual effect of the games. Uh, so, so we don't really look at the assets used because that's more for an artist role. We mainly look at uh, how your uh, how, how your code is structured. Uh, but thereby, I would like to say uh, it is important to have some uh, cooperation games on your portfolio as well. So you can showcase your uh, teamwork abilities as well, um, where I would really recommend, and I will also touch on that a little bit later, uh, to really work more on also creating some uh, or uh, participating in game jams uh, so you can work with other artists and use their art and learn how to implement their art because knowing how to communicate with artists and communicate your needs and implementing uh, art uh, is also an essential skill uh, to showcase on your portfolio if you eventually gonna apply for jobs but it's uh, it's not a must. You can basically also get a job if you only have basic shapes and have really good uh, good code uh, behind it uh, that really showcase your uh, programming uh, skills. So good question again. If this were all the questions, I will uh, go to the next slide. There's any other following up questions? Please let me know. Oh, there's another one. Uh, how how could macOS uh, be useful for creating games for iOS? Uh, is it through Xcode? Uh, how are games from iOS uh, generally made? Um, yes, uh, for macOS, uh, code are always uh, distributed through uh, Xcode. That's why you do need a Mac. Uh, at least I have not found a way to create a or to to publish a game for uh, iOS without the Mac. Um, so basically, uh, so basically, having a Mac OS is only required if you really want to make Mac or iOS uh, applications uh, for, for for Apple products. But also, as we have in the industry, uh, we uh, usually use uh, uh, some uh, Mac Minis, and we set them up to build these automate uh, build them automatically. So they, uh, we built some uh, tools for them so you can fetch a, pro a project and let it automatically build on Mac and let it upload to a, a distribution platform like TestFlight or other distribution platforms so we can also get and test uh, on iOS when you make games both for Android uh, and, and Apple. And I think there are also online solutions, but I, I don't know and I cannot really recommend any that uh, do my similar stuff like this automation for you too, but I'm not too sure about that. Uh, another question for 3D games: What what is the shape that is used the most to uh, to construct environments? Um, well, the most used shapes are are obviously uh, boxes and circles, uh, and then uh, and uh, cylinders. Cylinders often for a character, uh, boxes to create uh, houses, etc., and circles to well, well create other and more and, and triangles um, as well, of course, like pyramids to yeah, shape your objects. So those are uh, commonly used for uh, prototyping or extra questions. Okay, so no more questions. I will move to the next slide, uh, which are some uh, common assumptions. And I actually also want to play this game a little bit with you, with the audience as well, because uh, these questions I want to like to know if you think uh, this assumption is true or false. So uh, unfortunately, I cannot see you all, but uh, I will give you all a moment to think about it. So the first um, a statement is uh, you, must, you must play a lot of games uh, to be a good game developer. And I want to know if people think. All right. So if, if, if you want to respond, uh, if, you, um, if you think you must be, uh, play a lot of, of games to be a good game developer, um, 
just put a uh, a think or cross or incorrect or correct when you think this is true. And I, I give you seven seconds and then I will uh, give you the answer. All right, the answer is, well, luckily Saab already said it, incorrect. Uh, it's true, it's incorrect. Uh, actually also for, uh, I myself am also a, a great example for this. Uh, I don't play games a lot at all. Like uh, I think I haven't been touching uh, playing games for a while at the moment, for a few months at least. Uh, it's basically when you start to create games, of course you need to have a passion for games, but one, a uh, mistake that's been made a lot is that a lot of people get into games de get game development because they really like playing games a lot. And then once they see how games are made uh, and they see how different it is from make from playing games, they often uh, often bail out, which I think really is a shame. Uh, I remember when I was in college, we started with uh, 150 programmers, uh, which all wanted to be uh, a game developer or a game programmer. And in the end, we educate or we graduated with just 16 uh, because well, in the first year already around 80, 90 people uh, bailed off because they really underestimated how much work there is or delays between uh, or within making games. Um, thereby said, uh, playing games is still a good thing if you are a game developer, basically to uh, know the latest trend, know what um, yeah, what what uh, what the current... Um, game community is about, what they like uh, and what kind of features there are being used a lot. Uh, so you do need to have an understanding of the games, but that can also be achieved by uh, keep following the yeah, games community, keep following what games are being released, but you don't really need to play them or spend a lot of time on it as well. It's just casual playing. It's also it's also fine or not playing at all. It just You just need to have a general interest on how games are made. So then I, need, uh, I will go to the next statement, which is making video games is only for young people. And I will give you again around 10 seconds for if you think this is correct or incorrect, uh, you can indeed put on a cross or a uh, check mark. Cool. I see a lot of crosses, uh, which is a good thing. Um, this is also mainly, uh, I, there are also often quite a few people that are, well, let's say in their 30s and uh, they want to change careers and they think like, yeah, yeah I, I, I really like playing games. I would also like to make games or uh, I, I think the games industry is really interesting or I see a lot of people going that route. I would also like to go that route, but I think like, is am I too late? Uh, and well, the, the answer is basically you're never too late. Um, I also have worked with a lot of game developers, game programmers that started uh, their career in their 30s or some, sometimes even later. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Everyone can learn it. It's also just, yeah, th there is no age bounded to where you need to ma uh, start making video games. For me personally, I was just, uh, well, yeah, uh, I said like I, I was, I was just happy that I was uh, be able to do it at a young age. Uh, when because when I had my injury, I started to uh, fiddle around with how games were made, and that's how I got in the industry. So I was also very young where I, when I started. I was 21 when I landed my first uh, job. Uh, but yeah, when I landed my first job, I was also one of the youngest, and I'm I still am. So even though I'm in the industry for seven years, there are a lot of people uh, who start later or get into this field later or switch. Uh, disciplines and there are also people that start within art and later get into programming or uh, vice versa uh, there is no age bounded to it so then we go to the next statement which is you need the latest and greatest technology uh, to, to be able to make video games uh, let me know if you think this is correct or incorrect I see a lot of crosses and I even see a good uh, question or well statement about depends on the game you want to make. 
Well, it is actually cross, and I would also like to say it, it doesn't really matter on what game you want to create as well. Uh, it only depends on the scale of the game you are making, but to, you, you, you can make really ambitious games with a shitty computer as well. And I can also back this up with, if you look back in the day, uh, when games were made like uh, Bioshock or uh, like the first Lara Croft, they were also not using the best PCs. Uh, because, well, back in the time they were using the best PCs, but for to create similar uh, results nowadays, uh, it's really easy. Well, not really easy, but it is. You you are able to to create that with your uh, with with some older devices as well. So I kind of get it that it depends on the game, but basically for learning and understanding of how to make a top notch or a very big skilled game, you. Uh, you can learn how to create it on all technologies. And once you get into a job, you can showcase your skills you have learned and then use that combined with the technology another company can provide you uh, within their structure to really make uh, uh, make make this ambitious stuff work. But to learn, especially to learn and to create uh, uh, features and such, uh, and such like that, you don't really need to have the latest and greatest technology to make video games. So. Uh, but good, uh, good points you made there. By uh, depending on the game, I like that. So the next uh, topic will be your soft skills are just as important as your technical skills. I would like to know if people think this is correct or incorrect. Well, I like it that uh, I think I should have. Uh, uh, I said um, harder assumptions the next time when I'm going to do this uh, pres type of presentation because you're all uh, correct again. Uh, soft scale skills are really important within the uh, within the industry as well, especially uh, when you are working with a team. You, your soft skills really also work uh, well. If you, for example, but which people all often have a wrong assumption of is that if you want to be a senior programmer, you uh, really need to be uh, the best programmer in the world and uh, you really need to know everything about it. Uh, but basically, your seniority and your mediority skill uh, also comes a lot from your soft skills. Uh, it's ma mainly about leadership, knowing how to lead, how to mentor other people. That's really where your uh, levels lay. Of course, there's also some hard skills, your technical skills that also lays in there. But it's basically in combination because you it's hard to mentor or to lead a team if you don't understand the technology behind it. Uh, and that, yeah. But in the end, um, being able to communicate and such is really important. Uh, and also what I would like to mention for that is that, uh, especially in industry, there are a lot of people that are quite shy and don't really like to work on their soft skills. I totally get that. Uh, but one thing which is really nice, and I see a lot of people shine, even though they don't have good soft skills uh, in, a, in, in society, let's say, they can have great soft skills within a company because you can, uh, well, share it with your passion or share it uh, just from behind the screen and from your own, uh, uh, your your virtual persona instead. Uh, so that makes it much easier, in my opinion, to learn your soft skills if you don't really like the social soft skills of going out and talk with people. Because in this case, we only talk with people by typing <laughs> instead. So let me get to the next assumption, which is it is very easy to make quick money with making video games. Do you think this is correct or incorrect? Again, a lot of people are correct. It's uh, it's not easy at all. It is uh, often people when they start getting into the industry, they think, uh, yeah, these these big hits like uh, like Angry Birds, etc. They, they really make a lot of money and it's true there is a lot of money being made in the industry uh, there goes a lot of money within games but it's 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 really hard to to make uh, to make quick money with it uh, you really need to to build a community around your company around the games your company make uh, and then get that going and then you try to get uh, and, and then you eventually get a passive in uh, or good passive income from it especially for indie game developers this is quite hard. Uh, for example, where 
but but for example where i work where with paladin studios where we also work with big publishers like uh, bandai namco and netflix etc really really have their yeah yeah their uh, publishing power to to get uh, to make uh, games um yeah, succeed uh much easier uh, but from other standpoints if you are like I said, a, a smaller uh, a smaller developer, it's really really hard to make that uh, that easy money quick. Uh, you really need to be lucky that the game goes viral, that the game hits, that the game lands good with other people. Uh, and also, like uh, like I see Nafin said, uh, if you have done good marketing, there may be. Uh, there's unfortunately now for I think the last ten years that uh, that organic growth on games is not a thing anymore. Uh, uh, growth needs to be bought and uh, people who have a lot of money already or have made a lot of money already with making games then kind of have got this monopoly on uh, yeah, making easy money with games because they have already done it before. But to, to get there, you really need to yeah make a lot of games and keep trying until something sticks. Uh, well, uh, Angry Birds is a great example, which was their last and 50th uh, game they tried to create uh, and then suddenly it hit and uh, their company became uh, one of the biggest uh, mobile studios. So uh, it is always possible. So then I go to the to the last statement, the last assumption uh, is that continuous learning is essential. And then I specifically mean about that you can never truly master a career in making video games. Do you think this is correct or incorrect? And indeed, this is also correct. I'm a bit sad that everyone has everything uh, correct, but it also means that you already have the right assumptions about uh, about making video games, which is really good. Uh, well, you will never be able to do truly master a career in uh, making video games. I also work with uh, programmers that are in the field for 15, sometimes 20 plus years, and they still keep learning. They still learn new tools. They still learn new things, especially nowadays also with the uh, upcoming AI trends. They learn more about the uh, AI models and stuff. So it, it just keeps evolving and new tools keep coming, new uh, type of games keep getting, getting interesting. Uh, new devices are coming, like now with the Meta Quest 3 and the, uh, uh, the Apple uh, uh, the Apple Glass uh, thing, the Vision Pro, I mean. Uh, it con It's continuously um, moving and continuously learning. So you will never truly master it. But... Uh, you will get eventually, if you have a lot of experience, you will get to a level that uh, it will be really easy to learn new stuff and to get into new technologies quicker. But mastering is not never uh, is will, will never really happen. So that was uh, the common assumptions. Uh, now I will move on to a um, a roadmap. But before I do that, I would like to know if there's any assumption you have. Uh, and you would like to have answered if that is true or false, and then I will uh, yeah, elaborate a bit on it. But please let me know if you have any question or uh, or assumption about uh, making video games. I see one coming, which is does choosing the genre of a game really matter as an indie game developer uh, aiming to develop a profitable project? Uh, well, choosing a genre uh, for, for your game and it does really matter for your, for your game, especially as an indie game developer, also because you really need to focus on a niche group. Uh, like I said, I think it's especially important to, if you are an indie, indie game developer, to build a connection with um, uh, with a community, to really build a community about around the games you create, uh, so you can um, so, so it can grow uh, over time and you can then make better hits over time as well. Um, so it's really important to choose a genre and uh, the people that hit or that are connected with the genre and like the game you've created, that they will also like the next game you will create within that, within that specific genre. I hope that uh, answers your question a bit. Um, is there still hope in game development since due to the huge layoffs? Um, yes, there is. Uh, I also can totally understand this question. Uh, but uh, the huge layoffs are also mainly because of a lot of uh, big companies have, um, uh, I say it like the overspended in 
uh, in their hiring process because of during the pandemic, a lot of jobs uh, uh, came on the market because there was a lot of interest in new games. Uh, but now the pandemic has changed and these big companies need to make space for either the games they have developed or uh, uh, stuff is starting to uh, to get to their end from projects. But it doesn't mean that there are other that there are other companies that are still willing to hire. There are still a lot of other big companies that want to hire. There are other companies that um, that that have risen up, risen up since the pandemic, which are still searching for uh, for developers. So there is still a lot of hope for uh, developers to to get your job, even though there are big layoffs. But yeah, that's unfortunately something within the tech industry we always need to be aware of that there will always be a time that you can be. Yeah, can get suddenly laid off. That's yeah, and just an unfortunate thing that happens. Um, but uh, luckily, we still have a very uh, big um, need of technology in the in the in the world, and people still really like to to play games. And there are games that are uh, rising as well, and they are expanding. So it's always possible to find uh, to find somewhere to work. But I can understand the the, the fear of it. Uh, a solo developer cannot port a game. Um, I think if if I understand it correctly, is that well, if if we port a game is uh, when um, when you port a game from one technology to another, so let's say to from PlayStation to uh, PC or from uh, Switch to other consoles. Uh, for a solo developer, I think that's still possible. I don't see why not, uh, but it is much harder because what. Well, you also have still other stuff to work on and porting is often not something that is a lot of fun to do because you're still basically doing the same job you were always doing but then or, or you've already done but making it again for another uh, uh, for another technology so for another uh, platform I hope that answers your question a bit uh, if not please uh, elaborate a bit on what your question is No more questions. All right, then I'd like to uh, move on to a roadmap. I've developed this roadmap uh, also especially for this talk for you, uh, which is from here more for programming. I also have one a little bit more generalistic as well. But this is uh, my very personal roadmap I would like to suggest for you as my tips of how I would uh, get through uh, making video games again when uh, I would start over. I also would like to say that it's uh, give this process time. It's okay to take two to three years of studying before you are ready. Uh, it's for some people, it even takes two to three years to become comfortable making games, especially if you do it in your spare time. Uh, it really depends on your situation and such like that. But uh, the first thing I will always recommend is to learn the basics of programming. Uh, basically, just search online for C Sharp or Java or other programming languages you might are interested in or you are connected to uh, because of uh, people around you and then just uh, search for the uh, beginners free course uh, and especially search for a free course um, as you as i don't really like people to spend uh, money on something they are not sure about yet and there are a lot of uh, free courses that are really good for beginners to learn about how programming works uh, how arrays are set up how how to make simple applications then uh, the next step and this is only if you're interested you can really skip this part if you don't like it but mod the game you like and what i mean with this is just like i did when i was in hospitalized i started to create a private server of runescape uh, you can do the same uh, i see people making uh, mods for uh, gta i see people making mods for terraria for uh, for minecraft just do that and play around with it you will always learn a lot from this to know how on a bigger scale uh, games are created, which can be really uh, really beneficial in a later state. Uh, then before you're gonna uh, start working on game engines, I would still really, really, really recommend you to start gaming, uh, making games from scratch. Uh, I mean with this, just making a game in plain C Sharp, uh, plain Java, of course use uh, some kind of uh, library to, uh, to, to get the visuals done, to get the rendering, uh, um, of the application, uh, but make sure that you that you do all the mathematics from scratch. So you learn how vectors work, how 
to move a object uh, on the screen uh, and thereby games like Guess the Number, Tic-Tac-Toe, Asteroids, and Pac-Man are great exercises to create from scratch. So you learn, so you really learn about movement calculations uh, and it, in, in, in the case of Pac-Man, also some simple AIs and how to research to make those happen. So really make games from scratch uh, before starting to get into engines so you understand more of, of the tools in engines. Uh, thereby also before moving to engines, experiment with mathematics and physics programming. Uh, what I mean with that is create some simple simulations, uh, create uh, two balls uh, colliding to each other and bouncing off, which we call elastic collision, uh, create some experiments with that and really learn and have fun with it. Uh, so you so you understand on how some mathematical concepts are being applied in, uh, in programming. Uh, when you've got that all done, when you create some games from scratch, experiment with some mathematics uh, or physics uh, simulations, then choose an engine and stick for it at least for a short while, uh, go for it for a few months, I would say a year maybe, uh, really create games in a single engine, like Unity, Unreal, Godot, uh, Game Maker, uh, just really have fun and make some some games that you can uh, release for free on itch.io or uh, release them on mobile, uh, if, if, if you can, uh, and get some feedback out of it or just having fun with it basically. Uh, and the reason I would I like to say to go to game engines on a later stage is uh, one thing I see uh, going wrong a lot is that people get um, uh, uh, I say it uh, get spoiled by features engines provide uh, because you can get spoiled because of how they already do a lot of mathematics for you. Uh, it's not a bad thing uh, because you still know how to face certain challenges and how to resolve them. But in the long run, uh, in the long run of your career, it's also good to know how it works without the engine. So if you are, for example, eventually going to move from a, a company that works with Unity to a company that works on creating their own engine, that you know uh, how to create or develop those stuff as well. Or still also, if you use an engine like Unity, uh, I also have had many situations where Unity didn't provide the specific need I had for a specific feature. And then I had to write it my own and have the mathematical challenges there within the engine as well so it's really it can be really important to understand how uh, mathematics and physics are applied uh, in making or programming in general in or in making games in general but thereby also i want to have said if you have skipped this part already and you're already working a lot with game engines that's also fine but i that would then also really recommend to try and make a game from scratch from time to time as well to see if you truly uh understand how to program a lot of stuff uh, yourself as well. Uh, and it can also be a, a lot of fun. And in my personal uh, experience, I can also say that it makes, it, it also helps you understand some um, some tools uh, engines have more as well, because you then know how to create them yourself. All right. And then when you're comfortable with a game engine, then join a game jam. You have this website, which is itch.io slash jams. There will be another slide, an image of it. Uh, where you have a huge backlog of current active uh, game jams and also uh, coming game jams, you can just uh, you can just apply to and follow them, and you can join the discords and uh, uh, create a team, or you can uh, already gather some friends yourself and uh, define your own team, or you can go solo and create a whole game by your own. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and it's really, really, really beneficial for your uh, learning curve to learn how games are made and how to work together with other people and how to and get gather some feedback on your uh, on, on your skills. Then when you have been working on uh, on game jams, uh, I would still say continue working on game jams also until the last point of this with creating a portfolio. But then uh, for programming, I would really recommend to uh, to start and learning about applying uh, design patterns. Uh, when I was a student, I felt design patterns were really uh, overcomplicating things and were that necessary. But uh, within my career, I really realized that design patterns are really, really important for the overall structure of of projects. And you will really you will always face them when you move into a company, uh, where you start to work on uh, on projects. And especially the bigger the, the scale and the bigger the size of of games, the more uh, knowledge of design patterns are required. So really do have an understanding of design patterns and how they work. 
a great book I can uh, recommend, which you can also read online for free, is basically uh, game design pattern or game programming patterns dot com. Uh, it's 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 a book and it's a it's it's a, it's a website where you can read it for free. It's it's a it's a perfect book to learn about uh, how to use, apply, and how design patterns are used within programming. Uh, then another thing I would really uh, recommend to start working with is uh, with version control, uh, likes of GitHub, Bitbucket, and you have more. Uh, this is a tool we use to share and um, yeah, develop our games to have uh, backups or have uh, different stages of our or different versions of our games. Um, it's really important to know this from an early age a stage as well. So you uh, eventually, if you're going to work together, especially also with game jams that you know how to share, how to co uh, cooperate with other or collaborate with other people um, and that you can all work uh, on the same project uh, from the same repository. And then uh, one of the last things is uh, try to experiment with existing projects. If you know how to apply version control, uh, you will also know that on GitHub, you can find other projects, open projects, open source projects. Uh, try to play around with them. Especially this is important because if you eventually gonna join a company, uh, you will always work on a game that's already in development. Uh, and to gain the skill of knowing how to work on games that are already in development, you really need to uh, exercise yourself with working on existing projects. So just download the project uh, from the internet, uh, fr from GitHub, or work uh, or work also uh, on an open source project, uh, so you can contribute to it as well. And then just add and try to play around with the features that are. It's a bit like modding a game, but then more advanced by literally going into the code of the game that's already uh, released or that's about to be released or is open sourced online. Uh, that you can yeah, get your experience on how how that works. And then the last part is uh, creating a portfolio uh, where you can showcase your your games, especially, for example, your experiments with mathematics and physics. I would really put them on your portfolio to showcase that you have some, some interest in there and that you have some solid understanding of how to apply math and, uh, and physics in programming. Uh, and then also at your game jams, especially the game jams you are, uh, are proud of, add them to your portfolio so the uh, applicants can see or the interviewers can see that you uh, that you make some made some cool games uh, over the over the last period. If there are any questions regarding this roadmap, I would like to answer them. So uh, feel free to uh, ask any questions about it. And also feel free to screenshot this uh, for later usage if you like. I see not many questions coming in. So for now, I will uh, move forward. For other disciplines, oh. and the question is, is it worth spending on assets? Uh, yes, it's it's definitely worth it. Uh, we, uh, well, within uh, industry, we always uh, uh, spend a lot of uh, money also on assets and features for others because it can save a lot of time and especially time you might don't want to spend, especially with prototyping. To spend uh, days on developing a feature while you can might also buy it for let's say 20 euros uh, or, or 20 dollars uh, from the asset store so it's definitely worth it but be of course uh, cautious about what you buy and, uh, and really choose what to buy i would also like to say especially regarding to art uh, on itch.io you also have a asset section uh, where there are also a lot of free assets, uh, which where I personally always use when I'm joining a, a game jam uh, that I join solo or I join with another programmer. Uh, I always uh, download free asset pack and uh, add copyrights to them uh, to the end to, to the end project uh, for for solo projects. That's always uh, something I would recommend to do so you can showcase uh, that you know how to apply these assets and uh, you can also make it a bit. A bit more visual appealing. Another question: If we were to make a game from scratch, is it better to view tutorials uh, uh, and then uh, and and replicate it? Um, yes, it's it's really good to to watch tutorials for it. Uh, I will also have a point about it in a later slide. But what the most important thing is, if you're gonna make games from scratch and you watch a tutorial or you follow a tutorial is to not uh, get in this uh, this tutorial hell uh, where you will 
be making it to or following a tutorial, writing it all, or or, or basically duplicating what they are doing, and then leave it there and maybe have no idea what you have done or what you have been written. Always when you are done with a tutorial, try to play around with it, add new features to it, uh, change some stuff, change some colors maybe, uh, if that's something you don't really understand yet, then uh, th that way you always um, uh, challenge your, or always challenge yourself to exercise with the end result of a tutorial to really know what you have learned and or even better, try to apply it in a game you are creating beside the tutorial. So you learn how to apply uh, single features from tutorials into a game and get that to work as well. Another question is, can I specialize in gameplay programming without learning anything about game engine or graphics programming? Uh, absolutely, you can learn uh, a lot of gameplay programmers I know uh, also don't know about uh, game engine or graphics programming. Uh, they often only know about uh, gameplay specific mathematical features like uh, algebra for the movements and stuff. Uh, so that's definitely something that's possible. Uh, I would only say, but you could also wait for opportunities to, to rise where it will become necessary. Uh, but I would recommend to, um, to keep an eye on, uh, on, on, on being able to learn more about engine of graphics programming as well, because there will be situations where your gameplay will be limited because of some graphics or engine features. Um, if you have some graphics or engine, uh, tools that are not, uh, are, are not there to 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 realize your needs of of a gameplay mechanic then you need to know how to develop them yourself in an engine or a graphic uh programming uh environment as well a, a suggestion for a, a question to suggest on how to study for vector mathematics uh, there are some great uh online resources uh, especially uh Khan academy um i will write it down Khan Academy has a lot of uh, of great free um, I said, uh, uh, courses or classes on how they explain about vector mathematics uh, with some code examples as well. Also, if you, which I really could recommend is, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's brilliant.org uh, is also a, uh, it, it's a paid tool, but it's a tool you can buy or play on your phone to really get some daily exercises, which you can then also use for uh, for studying vector mathematics, which I can also really recommend, but uh, Khan Academy is definitely one uh, I can uh, I can recommend to learn to study vector mathematics. It's also the one I used uh, back in the day. No more questions. So here I also have a roadmap for other disciplines. Um, well, as I said, I am a programmer, so I I cannot truly say on how the the best uh, roadmap would be for, let's say, an artist or a designer or uh, whatever. So uh, in that sense, I would first say to learn the basics of the discipline, search for beginner courses or uh, for free online uh, about art, about 3D uh, environment, uh, level design, game design, etc. cetera. Uh, then I would still say uh, mod the game uh, you like to play. If you're interested, you can still skip this part. But uh, let's say you want to be a level designer or you want to know more about game design, uh, then try to play around with, uh, with 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 modding a game like GTA again or uh, Minecraft and and try to play around with that discipline within that game. Uh, change the economy, for example, change assets, uh, make a Minecraft uh, mod with uh, with better looking assets instead of all the blocks, etc. Uh, then I would say make some assets, especially for artists and uh, designers. Uh, create some uh, uh, some 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 art assets. Uh, you can also then host them online for free or host them online on uh, for, for a small payment on Ipsodio. Uh, and for uh, designers, try to make some puzzles, uh, post them online, post them on social media, for example, and uh, get some feedback of what people think of these puzzles. Uh, then again, choose uh, an engine and stick for it, at least for a short while. Uh, and when you are comfortable with a game, uh, game engine, join Game Jams within this discipline as an artist, as a designer. Uh, and also learn more about uh, how to apply version control because also artists, game design, and et cetera, also need to know how to work with programmers, et cetera. So, so they need to know how um, how to apply it in version control uh, and then also play around with existing projects, uh, try to uh, cooperate with uh, or collaborate with uh, open source projects, open source games that will be released uh, uh, to, yeah, to, to 
understand how that works, and then also create a portfolio out of all these steps. So that's, uh, and again, give this process time. It's okay to take two to three years of studying before applying uh, for the overall, overall discipline uh, roadmap. So I hope if there's anyone that doesn't want to be a programmer uh, has their questions answered here as well. Um, there are some important important tips. Well, the tutorial hell I already uh, provided. Uh, don't uh, follow uh, blindly follow uh, tutorials to prevent this. Uh, create something from the tutorial, change or add to me me mechanics so you can trust your knowledge and truly understand it. Another uh, important tip I have is to really keep following your interest, not other others. There's this great quote from uh, Roy T. Bennett, which is there is much more to life than following others' prescribed path. There is so much more to life than uh, than what other uh, than what you than what you experience right now. You need to decide uh, who you are for yourself, uh, which I think is a powerful message because there are so many disciplines to choose, and maybe you have a good friend or maybe you have an uncle that is a gameplay programmer. But if you really want to make servers or backend for 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 games, then really keep following that path. And the same. Um, the same is actually for the last point is believing in your ideas. If you have a game you think will be a hit, keep believing it, even though other people say that it's uh, that it's shit or that it's not going to make it. Just use that as feedback and keep improving it to make your idea work in the end. But don't stop uh, believing in it. And the same is for uh, don't stop creating, keep experimenting and keep having fun. Uh, the beauty of the games industry is that we can easily transform our hobby into a career. So keep having fun like it's your hobby. Uh, in my personal example, I keep creating stuff when I'm when I'm coming home from work. Uh, I really uh, value this so I can keep having fun at work as well and without getting in this uh, yeah loop eventually of seeing creating games really as a job instead of seeing it as something fun because it's it's, it's really something that can uh, can be transformed from your hobby. So keep it a hobby as well. But those are some important tips regarding to the roadmap. And some highlights I have is uh, choose an engine, like I said, Unity, Unreal, version control, you have uh, GitHub, and for gems, you have itch.io slash gems. And here I have a screenshot of how this, for example, looks from at the moment. You have a lot of gems that are active, uh, but you can also join some other gems upcoming, uh, see their description, see their requirements, uh, and, uh, and have fun joining them then. So if there's any questions regarding this, Roadmap highlight, uh, please feel to to still ask them, and uh, that otherwise I will move to uh, to the other part. Cool, no more questions. So the last part I would like to talk about are the AI trends we have within uh, within the games industry. Where you have this cool GIF I, for example, already have uh, put in here where you can just ask to do a backflip and this model will instantly do a backflip. Um, I will quickly show you this uh, video of uh, Unity where they showcased um, the iteration of Unity Muse, which is uh, yeah, some really cool, I will, I will explain after. So here you have uh, Unity Muse, which they are developing, which is really cool. I've also seen some live demos of it at uh, at Unite this year or last year. It's uh, they are really creating a lot of uh, AI tools for us to enhance our uh, game development experience. Uh, but we also have the same for Unreal. I will also quickly show you a part of this presentation uh, where they showcase uh, uh, some some highlights about well here automatically generated. Um, uh, yeah, structures within the within the map. So if they're gonna move around, uh, here was also a great example of uh, how they can change the vegetation of the entire uh, landscaping.
So yes, with this, uh, oh. so with this, the AI trends are really uh, yeah evolving rapidly within the industry, and I understand that a lot of people are afraid of it as well. Uh, but my short answer, if we need to be afraid of AI, is uh, is no. Uh, I think AI is 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 a great um, new innovation within the industry. Uh, and my long answer, I base on that we uh, must value to enhance and increase productivity for making better games, uh, especially back in the day when uh, Unity and Unreal became uh, open for the public. Uh, I remember I was just in college when uh, Unity uh, 5 came out. Um, and then a lot of developers were like, but now a lot of these shitty games will come out. A lot of people will be able to mass produce games, etc. Uh, and that also happened a lot. And it's 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 a true um, fear a lot of developers have and a lot of uh, developers also still have with AI but also at the at the other side it also helped us making better games making games more uh, uh, by making more um, for, for, for the communities uh, having more people understand game development having more people getting into this field as well and I think this is the same with AI unfortunately it will uh, it, it it will be an end of some uh, some disciplines probably, but it will also open new uh, opportunities for new disciplines to come, which well I cannot fill in at the moment because we have to see that in the end. But there there lays a lot of value within AI. Uh, so yes, it is scary, but it's also exciting. So let's focus on utilizing it instead of seeing all the fears behind it. Um, I think especially also with uh, with the video I showed from Unity where you can really rapidly create ideas and showcase them and have uh, different animations shown, et cetera. Uh, in the end, you will still need an animation or an animator to make the perfect animation for your project because, well, you can still have it AI generated, but it will never be as perfect as we really want it to be. Yeah, or you will keep, uh, uh, keep prompting 10,000 different uh, 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 instructions to generate a, diff, a specific uh, animation, uh, which then can still be grateful for solo developers to be able to make uh, certain games without having all the knowledge of uh, of the of the animations and such. So that's my verdict of it. And then with that, there's also the the end of my presentation actually. So I will uh, use this moment for everyone to, uh, to ask some questions, and I see. A question coming in as well, already as well. Um, so one of the question is, can two person using different PC work on the same project at the same time uh, with the help of GitHub? Um, yes, uh, two, uh, two persons using different uh, PCs for uh, can really work on the same project at the same time uh, with the help of GitHub. Uh, you can, uh, but you can create branches, you can commit together. So you can really collaborate uh, on it. There are some uh, implications there, especially also if you uh, when you work on Unity. If you both work on the same object, let's say, or you both work on the same scene, and you're gonna push it, or you're gonna yeah, push it together in uh, in the same repository, you will have some conflicts. Uh, but those are also really important to know how to solve them or learn how to solve them. So it's really important to start working with uh, one or more uh, or with two or more uh, programmers or. Uh, artists uh, together to get uh, or face these challenges of what happens when multiple people work on the same uh, the same asset or same uh, yeah, same object. So your short answer to the question is yes, two people can work uh, on from different PC on the same project. Questions, uh, another question, any resources to learn about commenting and doc documenting code? I don't quite understand what to write in the documents. I don't really have any resources per se. Uh, all I would say is um, try to document as much as possible uh, and try to gather feedback from it. Uh, the, the main way how I've learned how to uh, write proper documentation um, is by really creating them and actively ask for feedback for the people I create those documentation for. I can understand it's hard if you don't really have those people yet. Uh, what I back in the day then did was uh, uh, writing on forums, uh, writing some postmortems or writing or creating a feature, explaining it, and then gather some feedback there. Um, so the best the best resource to to learn about commenting and documenting code is by 
just doing it and gather feedback from people to delivering it to other people. The question is, how do we optimize a game? There are uh, thousands of ways to optimize a game, and it's also really specific uh, per game. Uh, but in uh, all the engines, we have uh, tools like opt uh, 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 how is it called? Uh, a profiler, where you can see where uh, the uh, spikes are within your game and from where they are coming from. And then you can uh, search or get uh, deeper into that code and see on, yeah, try to find on what is wrong, uh, try to play around with it. Uh, but there are also a lot of design patterns actually that are uh, developed for optimization. Uh, you can also think of some practical design patterns like uh, object pooling is a great uh, example of that, uh, where you uh, reuse certain assets to showcase different uh, functionality, uh, especially, for example, in a list we have it. Instead of having uh, 2,000 names in a list, we have uh, seven names in a list. And when you uh, and you only sh uh, show five, and when the one from the bottom uh, gets out of the field, it gets back to the top and it gets the name next name out of the list. And that way you will officially just have seven uh, visuals, but you can showcase them in code, all the thousands of names you want to uh, to do. Um, same, uh, the same works also for uh, having large scale uh, games where we uh, use something called Oculus Sculling where if the objects are behind the camera, they will not be rendered. They will only be uh, catched in the system. So when you move the camera, they will only be shown once they are within uh, the field of vision. So, that, but there, yeah, like I said, there are a lot of ways to optimize a game and it's really specific uh, on how you make a game. Uh, there are also specific needs per engine. Uh, also, if you work with physics, uh, the more, the deeper you go in the hierarchy, the more uh, 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 calculations Unity, for example, has to do. So if you work on a lot of physics, keep it minimal in hier hier hierarchical, hierarchical order, uh, mainly keeping them all uh, as single objects instead of parenting them to to, to uh, six or seven other, uh, 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 yeah, other objects. I hope that answers your question a little bit. Another question is, uh, during uh, a starting stage, is it better to be a developer uh, of my own uh, or to work in a, ga in a game in a company. Uh, during a starting stage, um, at, the, at the real original start, uh, just develop on your own, try to create uh, and make stuff. But if you get the opportunity to work for a company, I would definitely say get into a company. Also within uh, your study process, keep trying to apply for companies if possible uh, to get a feedback also for why you will not be hired. Uh, but also to, if you get uh, into a company, you will learn much faster about specific uh, needs within the industry or specific uh, techniques we use or or learn from others about uh, specific structures uh, to set up uh, specific games. So uh, at the starting stage, um, at, the, at the real beginning, you, all, you first need to learn, which you need to do on your own. And when you get comfortable and get the op opportunity to work for a company, definitely do it. Uh, any advice for aspiring game developers? Uh, well, just basically, I have all my advice uh, right here, which is uh, to not be uh, getting stuck into a tutorial hell. Uh, keep following your interest. Uh, don't stop creating and believe in your ideas. Uh, to, this ties together with the roadmap I've uh, created for this talk, uh, where yeah, this is basically what I would recommend and, uh, and, and advise you to follow uh, if, if possible. Um, but also, yeah, it also all ties together with keep having fun, don't stop creating, keep experimenting. Uh, keep doing what you really find interesting. If you believe that you really want to make the next GTA, then keep doing, try to chase that. Try to make a uh, open world game where you can walk around and you can drive around and interact with other NPCs. Uh, try to make that your goal to learn and try to find your ways to learn different sections of it. So like make a small game where you have dialogues, create a small game where you can move around, create a small game uh, where you can drive around and eventually combine them all to this big idea you might eventually have. That's why I would recommend to keep believing in your ideas if you really have something you think is cool. Well, if there are no more open questions, I think uh, the timing was also great as it's now, uh, well, for me, it's 
12 a.m. <laughs> Oh, I see the link for my Instagram is incorrect. It's uh... is it twelve a.m. there, sir? I mean, that's actually very great for you to spend that much time with us. Thank you, sir. As we have reached the end of today's webinar, a heartfelt thank you for joining our event today. Special thanks to our speaker, Mr. Justin Scott, for sharing valuable insights. Your participation made this event a success. A huge thanks for answering everyone's queries. Let's carry this newfound knowledge forward. Have a great day. Thank you. And thank you all for joining. Yes, so thank you, Justin, for... Uh joining us today and sharing the sharing your valuable insights your expertise and perspective have enriched our discussion and we have we are grateful for your contribution to this webinar so thank you once again for being here with us and accepting my invite to join oh. the webinar yes no. so we have came to the end of the session and i have something to share with you So here is how the Community Builders Program of Angel Hack comes in. So join the Angel Hack Community Builders Program and embark on a journey unlike any other. So gain real, real skills, transformative communication abilities, and practical experience to ex excel in community building. So highlights include high-touch virtual courses with industry experts, personal mentorship from their re or relation professionals, practical resources and networking opportunities. Apply now if you are an undergraduate student with tech focus and active in developer communities. So registration deadline is Feb 2, 2024. Yes, so you can scan and register for the community builder program. Meanwhile, we have, uh, yes, so we are done with the session. Yes, sir. thank you so much once again. If you have any questions, you can also ask Justin. All right, cool. I see also there's one last question in the... One last question. In the, in the chat, is, uh, is piracy wrong? Uh, well, of course, piracy is wrong. Uh, but uh, if you keep it for your own uh, own studying, it can be it can be it can be good. Like I said, if you mod the game to uh, to learn from it and learn to understand on how stuff works from the game, then it's all fine. But piracy and duplicating it, like literally duplicating or replicating a game, uh, can cause uh, legal problems. I would not recommend you to get into. So uh, be careful with it. <laughs>